Hi everybody, welcome to week five, chapter five from Gamble and Gamble on Language. And I hope that you enjoyed last week and learned a lot and I enjoyed reading your posts. So I hope that as we go further, you will feel more comfortable sharing and giving me some more insight into what you're learning and what you're thinking about based on the readings and the lectures. So before we actually get into this week's content, I have a little experiment for us. I would like you on your paper to write down the directions from the classroom that you are in most often on campus to Einstein bagels in the Marshall Center. And there's no other directions other than that. So just please write down directions from the classroom you're in the most often on campus to Einstein bagels in the Marshall Center. And you'll probably need to go ahead and pause me. <laughs> so to go ahead and do that so you can write your directions. Once you have finished writing your directions, I would like you to imagine that you have to give them to a foreign exchange student who has just arrived on campus and is not familiar at all with the Tampa campus. So whatever you wrote down for your directions, imagine that you are now handing those over to someone who has never been there before. And if that's the case, I'd like you to consider if your directions are effective and why or why not. So if you felt that they were very effective, you were very thorough and you used extreme detail and they would be absolutely able to find their way, uh, maybe you could share those on your reflection post. And if you feel that they would have not made it five feet away without getting lost, then maybe you could share why you thought that it wasn't effective and what could have been done differently. So that is just a very brief experiment to show the power of language and how we use language to communicate and how we can be very effective and how language can be confusing and language can be, you know, very difficult to understand and language can be not specific enough, it can be too specific. So there's so many broad contexts that language applies to when it comes to communication and that's what we're going to spend time doing this week, talking about language. So words, words, and more words. We grow up, we learn words, we learn our language, and then what, what do we think about once we can communicate? How often do we consider the words that we use and why? So, oh, and I'm supposed to have it. Oh, okay, well, pretend I'm holding up. <laughs> this is really not very effective at all. Um, okay, the example was supposed to be a water bottle, okay, which is sitting over on the table over there. So pretend that I'm holding a water bottle. Um, so if I'm holding up this water bottle and I say, what is this? Most of you would respond water or water bottle, something like that. Now, my devil's advocacy question is, why do we call it a water bottle? And who decided that it should be called a water bottle? And I know those are kind of silly questions, but it's something to consider when we use words day in and day out because we have learned them and we have to communicate, but we don't often take the time to consider where did that word come from? Who decided that it should be called that? Where did that those series of letters evolve into a word and you know all of those complex things that go into the way that we speak so what if we decided we weren't going to use water bottle could we change it do we have to use the word water bottle what other options would we have if i woke up today and said i no longer am going to use the words water bottle i'm going to call it I don't know, um, <laughs> schnickel fritz, <laughs> you know, um, can, do I have the power to arbitrarily change what that is? Um, I think most people would argue no. And the reason why is because words are bound by culture and context and things like that. So and we'll actually get into those definitions. So just because I decide I'm going to make it appropriate for me to say that this means something else, 
the rest of the world would not necessarily agree. They wouldn't understand that word. They wouldn't understand that reference. So we are somewhat committed to the words that society has accepted. What conditions would have to exist before we can change something's name? And there have been societal changes in the words that we use. And so conditions can be created and can exist where we can change a name, but what conditions do you think would have to exist? So if you want to reflect about that, that's I know that's kind of a deep thought, but what what needs to happen in our society before a word can be changed and something can be called something else or come to mean something else? And can you think of other things around that have more than one name? And we'll actually do an activity about that a little later, but for right now, what items can you think of that have more than one name? And if you wanted to make a list and then share a couple of them in your reflection post, it might be interesting to see what you all come up with as far as multiple <clears throat> named items, so. Okay, so let's think about new words. Can you make a list, and you can either do it in your head or on paper, doesn't really matter, but what are some new words that have come into the language because of internet, TV, or technology? The first ones that come to my mind are Google as a verb. You know, you can Google it, uh, MapQuest it as a verb, I'll MapQuest it. Um, and there's actually an official term for a phrase or a word that becomes common public knowledge based on internet or TV or, you know, current reference. And it's actually the word mem, M-E-M-E. -E. And so when I think about certain phrases specifically that have become part of everyday common language that come from TV or movies, I think of the Arnold Schwarzenegger accent, I'll be back, that has been used widely and came from a movie. I think of, which I never watched Friends, and I know some of you might be, you know, your mouth on the floor right now, but my husband was a huge Friends fan, and so he tells me that Joey's How You Doin' <laughs> um, apparently became very popular. I'll take his word for it. Um, and so even... I am, you know, all I am you, um, I'll Facebook you, all of those things have all come into our everyday language. And it's very interesting, every year, the Webster's Dictionary posts new words that have been added to the dictionary. And it is so fascinating to make yourself aware of what words have been added to our English language dictionary. And so often they are words that have been based on a specific group that used the word and it became accepted or because of a mem, internet, TV, technology, those types of things. So very interesting how our language is modified and changed and adapts based on current things, current, you know, groups, current influences. So very interesting. Now, where did these words or things come from and who named them? Often it's originators of technology, so Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook or, um, you know, all of the powers that be at Google, they came up with these specific words or phrases, and so they just became popular based on that. And, you know, I, I'm assuming that sometimes it can just be more of a social thing. I don't know that the originators always are the ones that introduce those into language, but very often that is how it happens. So what about new words from other sources? We specifically referenced internet TV technology, but can you think of other sources that can add new words into our language? And if you can, please feel free to share those on your reflection post. I think often um, athletes or celebrities create new words or new concepts that we introduce. And so, especially with reality TV and all of the celebrity coverage with paparazzi and all those things, we have an insight into that type of world so much more so than we have in the past. And so things can immediately become absorbed and immediately become infiltrated into our worlds just because we have that real-time information. And so it's interesting to think that sometimes we're influenced and our language changes based on 
someone or something saying something without even really thinking about it and it becomes so integrated into our culture as a result of that so very interesting and then another question how do words that mean one thing come to mean something else so if you can think of a word that at one point meant one thing and then it kind of is adapted or becomes synonymous with a new definition. Um, the thing that comes to my mind is the word bad, where let's say a hundred years ago, bad meant something negative. And in the Michael Jackson era, um, bad became cool. Um, and then interestingly, cool, another one, cool meaning chilly, originally, um, then becomes something neat. So we do have words that through social references, through cultural references, through group references, take on new meanings. And so if you can think of others, I'd love to hear some of your perspectives on words that have changed meanings. And interestingly, there are actually words that have changed meanings based on their level of offensiveness. And so I don't want to necessarily get into those words, but um, especially in the context of homosexuality, there have been quite a few words that at one point did not necessarily mean anything derogatory. Um, we kind of changed the, what the meaning of those words were and it became something derogatory. And then I think we've kind of sorted, sort of started to move out of that derogatory connotation for some of the words. And so, you know, there are certainly modifications and, you know, changes in definitions and things like that of different words. Okay, so obviously words are powerful. That's, you know, very obvious. How do words work? You know, how, how do we organize our language into things that make sense? Basically, words are symbols, and I know we've talked a lot about symbols so far, but they represent something else. So, a symbol is a word or a visual device. Now, it doesn't always have to be a word, but most often it is, that represents an image, sound, concept, or experience. Very similar to what we talked about in symbol the first couple weeks. So then if you understand the concept of symbol, then you move into the concept of a referent. And that is the thing that the symbol represents. I know that's a little bit vague, so I'll try to clear that up for you a little bit. So you have a symbol. So let's say your symbol is the word cat. Okay, you immediately in your mind, as soon as I said the word cat, you immediately connected a visual representation of a cat. It could be your cat, your pet when you were a kid, or your current pet. It could be Garfield. It could have been whatever your brain automatically connected when I said the word cat. The referent is the thing, the cat. And obviously, that's going to be different for every person. So referent is very individually specific. The symbol, the word, is C-A-T. Now, in Spanish, gato, G-A-T-O, is cat. So in another language, your symbol is different. But your referent is going to be a personal thing that the symbol represents to you. Okay? And so then you have a thought which is the mental process of creating the image triggered by the referent or symbol. So while they are three separate things, they all work almost simultaneously when you see or hear a word. So I want you to understand them in three distinct concepts, but I want you to also understand that they really are pretty synchronized with the word, the thing, and the image all kind of fuse all at once because that's the way we make sense of language. So, how would you say words are arbitrary? And if you're curious about the definition of arbitrary, I don't want to assume, uh, maybe for some of you non-native English speakers, that that would be an easy word to know. So, how are words random or not necessarily easily definable? Um, how are they assigned? How are words? How do we make sense of words? So think about that just for